Welcome to Unmasked Ideas from Many Districts. I'm Kathleen Freer. I'm the NISMA Woodwind Chair. And to be quite honest, that was the title we submitted, but we've decided because we are helping students develop musically, that what we really need to title this is Creating the Virtual Virtuoso. <laughs> Today I'm with my colleagues from Silverwood, as you could tell, an adult clarinet choir. Usually there are 14 of us, but the people that you will see this evening are teaching in dist several different districts and all of them teaching in different ways. They will describe what they're doing as well as we are encompassing all age groups from K through 12. All of our districts, though, are in central New York. Each person will give you ideas that have been developed to help the students enjoy their musical experiences and expand their musical knowledge. The last part of our session, we are going to play some good examples of music that hopefully will spur the students' interest to be playing in small groups. We want to help students and teachers find new ways to rehearse, to listen, and to create music. We hope you will ask yourself if our ideas could help you. Our first speaker is Liza. Hello, thank you for being, for choosing our um, workshop today. We're very excited to be working on this and putting our I ideas together and coming up with so I, what we hope to be a good resource for, for um, you as educators. And hopefully you can find a few things that you can take with you. So as Kathy said, my name is Liza. I'm a teacher in the Phoenix Central School District here in upstate New York. I um, have a 100% virtual situation this year. So I have high school band, I have lessons, I have music theory, and I have what we call a wind block, which is uh, actually just an opportunity, it's kind of like an ho extended homeroom, um, an opportunity to meet with kids and hopefully connect with them. Um, so today we're gonna talk about creating that virtual virtuoso, unmasking ideas, which I thought was a clever name. And um, one of the ways that we we're gonna do that is just to, to um, kind of let you know some of the things that we do in hopes that you can take it with you. So small ensembles are a great option if you have the ability to do that. But I don't have the ability to do any ensembles because I'm 100% virtual. So I had to come up with a different idea and a different approach so it's how is this going to work starting last spring when we were kind of forced into it. So the first thing to do is establish a goal, right? And so when we're thinking about it, it's like, okay, we're going to do everything the same. We're going to get ready for a concert that won't happen. We're, gonna, we're going to um, do lessons in, in the same way, even though you can do them only one student at a time and everybody else has to be uh, muted. Uh, all of that stuff, those were the goals. And then you had to let it go. Because obviously that isn't what we were gonna be able to do. So we came to understand that instead of focusing on music, we needed to focus on the whole student. And, uh, and, and we had to keep it fun because uh, these are classes that students don't have to take. And we want them to want to be here. But, we, uh, but more importantly, we want students to feel like they have somewhere to go during this hard time as well. So the music is, should be a release. It should be exciting and, and, and energizing for the kids. So I watched webinars and workshops and, um, and took a bunch of little things from that. And some of these things I'm sure you're going to see today uh, of what I, what I have done um, or what I have taken, you probably have already seen as well. But, um, so we had to develop some new goals. Keep kids in the program, right? So the question is, how, why did they start? And I asked them that on the first day of school. And the two answers they gave were because they loved music and because they wanted to be with their friends. So if we love music and we want to be with our friends, we need to create opportunities for those things to happen. And we have to do it in a different way. The best advice that I have seen on anything is to keep it simple, right? We don't need to complicate what we do 
and add that as stress in our lives and we don't want to stress our students. So we want to keep it simple. Um, so so our, our thinking has to uh, switch to what are we going to do now that's going to transfer to what they're going to do when we return to school. And that's where we came up with, or this is where I came up with some ideas um, that I thought might be useful to you and I would share today. So what do I use? I use a choice board, I use smart music, and I use Flipgrid. Those are the ones that I chose to talk about today because I think they're the biggest ones that are impacting my students right now. So the first is the choice board. So if you look at the example that, it's a handout, but it's also on the slide, and, and each title is a hyperlink, and the hyperlink takes them to the actual assignment. So the assignment, um, if it is a writing assignment, it's just, it's just a description of the assignment. Um, things like, uh, we're working on a piece called Walking Into History by Richard Saucedo, and it is about uh, the Clinton 12 in Tennessee. And so one of the choices was to write a little report on the Clinton 12 and, and what, that, what that situation was about. And um, so that, that was just a, a writing sample. But then there were others that were, uh, most of them, had to do with playing their instruments. So tricking them into playing, right? We still want them to play. So I asked, um, they, I asked them to click on the hyperlink that says, we want you. And it is a, an opportunity for them to talk about why they love music. There's another one. So they're grabbing their, um, uh, their they're going to actually talk about why they were there and encourage students to become a part of that. That's a great use of our time, and we can use that in a lot of different ways to recruit for, for uh, different ensembles and for our fifth grade beginning program. The choice board gives the kids choices. They can work on it throughout the quarter, and the, what they're doing is they're trying to get up to 35 points. So I make each, each block has a different point value um, assigned to it, and they just have to add up to 35. Getting back to those um, playing assignments, another one that's in there has to do with playing our national anthem. And we're going to talk about, I'm going to show that a, a little bit later, um, but it's another opportunity. So the choice board is a great, great way for students to kind of um, come up with their own schedule and come up with their own ideas and, and find their strengths and put them into, uh, into their assignments. Smart music. I think is a great resource, and I don't, I'm not here to sell smart music. Um, you don't have to use smart music to even do these exact things. This is just what I'm using. And smart music is, I think, a great resource to use to develop individual performances. And that is exactly what we do when we are playing in small ensembles, right? We're taking that third clarinet stigma, that second trumpet stigma, we're taking that away from the student and saying every part and we're really showing it because if you don't have every part playing, then we are missing some harmonies, we're missing some melodies, perhaps we're missing some really important pieces. And smart music is a great way to help to develop that in this time right now and any time, but it's a great way to do that. So the first thing I, I have up here that I wanted to show you is that the, um, the, the, if we look up just one book, it is written for every instrument. They can be easy, they can go up to more difficult, but it doesn't really matter. So when you open it up and you can see this is a typical clarinet part. The clarinet part for, um, uh, it, it looks exactly like you would expect a clarinet part to look. And then you look and here's the tuba part and it looks exactly like the clarinet part. And that's a rarity, right? You would all agree that that's not normal, it's not typical that we see the tuba have the melody. So this is a great opportunity to, uh, um, you know, expose our students to something that's a little more challenging, but also that maybe for the tuba player is, is, a, is rewarding as well, that they can actually play the melody for the first time. So um, it's a great way to develop skills in that regard. So Flipgrid is a program that is web-based and it makes recording our students so easy and I love it for this. So um, a lot of the assignments on that choice board had to do with Flipgrid and it brings them directly into a link which is the assignment for, um, uh, for the choice board choice. It brings them right to it and it's very user friendly. It's super easy to use and you don't have to worry about uh, how to send a video, compressing files, 
converting files. You don't have to worry about any of that because it's all part of the program. And it's a huge button. You just hit it to record and it's all right there. So it's a fantastic resource and you can use it for so many things. Some of them are doing a podcast. I thought that was a brilliant idea. I came across that one uh, in my, my many uh, s some journeys <laughs> into workshops and webinars. So um, I thought that was a great idea. And so my kids have come up with some really good things. They're talking about video games. They're interviewing former teachers who are, who are musicians or who have a passion for music. It was really wonderful to see. So um, that was one way that they used it. And then other ways is to actually perform. So some of those classes or some of those um, choices were about the U.S. Marine um, president's own band who has published on their website a bunch of um, practice challenges. So students watch that little video and then they demonstrate um, that practice challenge in their video. Another was the breathing gym, some of the exercises from the breathing gym, and they demonstrated those. So very simple. Another, of course, is solo time. They just play. Another was send a musical greeting card to somebody. So he's got some happy birthdays and some different things. So it, it's, a, it's a great way to do it. This one um, that, I, that I chose to share with you today was perform the national anthem. So I asked students to perform it because we can use those recordings at sporting events and um, assemblies and whatever we can do right now to get our students out and say, hey, we're still here. The performances are still happening. And it's a really simple way to do it without trying to mix and put kids uh, things together. And um, so the perform the national anthem was a very popular one. A lot of my students did that. This is Virginia. She has agreed to let me use her picture. And, um, and this is just her submission. She re recorded herself playing the national anthem and, uh, and sent it to me. And it was beautiful, and I will probably use it as, as soon as I can. So after all of that, those are just some of the, of the ideas that I had. I, I feel like the students having fun is the most important thing that they can do right now and um, to keep them involved in the program, to keep them playing. And, uh, you know, the, the quote a little ways back in the show, uh, in the slideshow said, uh, keep it fun and the meaningful will come. And that's by Elisa Jansen Jones, and who was another workshop um, that I watched. And I just loved that. I thought that was such an appropriate mantra to live by right now. So I hope that you have uh, been able to find some interesting things here. And when we get done with all of this, this is our future, right? They're gonna look just like this uh, president's own band and sound just like them, right? That's our goal. So up next is our friend Drew. Hi, uh, my name is Drew Rebecca, and I am a middle school band director at Roxborough Road Middle School, which is part of the North Syracuse Central School District. I work with Woodman students in grades five through seven. This year, our school is using the hybrid model, uh, where some students are in school Monday and Tuesday, some are in school Thursday, Friday, and a third cohort of students are fully virtual Monday through Friday. Uh, I see each cohort once a week for band rehearsal with students separated 12 feet apart while performing. Uh, fully virtual students are giving performance-based assignments that go along with what is being covered in class that day. And all of our music lessons are conducted virtually for all students, grades five through seven. As music educators, we are trained to be creative problem solvers and quick thinkers. Uh, this pandemic has amplified the need for these skills and requires us to think on our feet constantly. While it can be hectic and out of control at many times, uh, I believe it's important to try and find the silver lining uh, for our own sake and sanity. Uh, one positive change that this new way of teaching and learning has brought upon is the ability to go back to uh, the basics with our students. I'm sure I speak for many band directors when I say uh, that the weeks and sometimes even month leading up to a performance uh, can feel very stressful uh, and almost like a cram session at times. Uh, because of this, we don't get to spend nearly as much time on developing certain skills as we would like. Uh, with live performances on the back burner for the foreseeable future, my colleague and I uh, redesigned our curriculum to allow for a deep dive into concepts that we've had to gloss over in uh, favor of concert preparation in the past. 
One area that we've been able to devote a lot of time to uh, is rhythm reading. With the help of Rhythm Randomizer, we've been able to dedicate a lot of time uh, of each rehearsal to rhythm counting and performing. And uh, I, my seventh grade band students are uh, doing their best sight reading that I've heard from them um, you know, in my years of teaching. So it, the, uh, um, the uh, feedback on it is just, it's been uh, tremendous. Uh, we chose a, uh, each week we choose a particular rhythmic concept to focus on, such as syncopation, and we use Rhythm Randomizer to generate a short rhythmic example. Uh, we start by speaking and clapping the rhythm. When students uh, feel uh, that they can you know, demonstrate a good understanding of that, we transition into playing it on a concert B flat. Uh, for the final step, uh, my colleague and I create uh, sight reading examples that incorporate these rhythmic motifs into them so we can put them into real world examples. Uh, the concept is a basic one, but it's one that we, uh, was often overlooked in our program because we just simply didn't have enough time to fully explore it. Uh, we're also able to spend a lot more time on uh, other standards that just kind of uh, get overlooked generally. Uh, one of the big ones being improvisation. And we take these rhythmic ideas and uh, we improvise on them. Uh, students come up with a four beat or eight beat pattern and uh, we start by just speaking it and clapping it. And then we pass it along uh, our ensemble seamlessly from person to person. Uh, from there, we will take it and perform it on our instruments and give each student a chance to uh, improvise and create this rhythmic example to share with the group. Uh, you know, and it's just another example of um, just a, a skill that is you know, so important, especially at this age, uh, that we're just able to dedicate and devote a lot of more time to. Um, but next up is Lindsay, who will discuss uh, some more creative strategies in her unique situation. Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Barres, and I am the 6 through 12 instrumental music teacher at McGraw Central School. McGraw is a very small rural school district with roughly 500 students, grades 6 through 12. It's located just south of Cortland. Unlike many districts this year, my district is 100% um, in person five days a week. We do have a few students that chose um, to learn remotely, but for the most part, all of our students are in person. This means that for me, nearly 40 students in grades 6 through 12 are all scheduled for the same time period. I decided early on that um, I really wanted my students playing. Um, I knew it was going to be kind of a tricky situation because there are 40 of them during one 40 minute period, um, but I wanted to have them all playing at some point throughout the school year. Um, I'm a firm believer that part of our retention is getting our rehearsals to look as close to normal as we possibly can. Um, so I don't have a band room and that's something that has always been the case, um, which has kind of worked to my benefit um, in this situation. So I rehearse in the auditorium. Um, even with a large space, though, it wasn't possible for me to teach all of 40 of my students at one time. Um, you can see up here that there's a picture um, of my layout. Thankfully, I have a really large and deep pit. So between my pit and the stage, I'm able to fit 16, stu 16 wind students and five percussionists um, in a rehearsal at one time. So what I decided to do is I decided to break my concert band into two separate groups. Um, I have a woodwind ensemble with some percussionists as well as a brass ensemble with my other percussionists. Um, on days that woodwind ensemble plays, brass ensemble are in the auditorium seats six feet apart and masked and they are working on Google Classroom assignments. Um, oftentimes these assignments are theory based and have lessons or videos with a corresponding Google form for students to complete. The following rehearsal, the ensemble switch places. While I thought this was a good idea to split them into two, um, initially I found that finding music that's appropriate for age levels 6th through 12th grade in a smaller um, setting was pretty tricky. Um, one day I found J on JW Pepper, I stumbled upon Flexibility Holiday arranged by Victor Lopez. Um, the Flexibility series is for solo, duet, trio, quartet, or any small or large ensembles, woodwinds, brass, strings, or percussion. Um, pieces in these books can be played with any combination of instruments with varying le levels of experience and ability. This is huge for me. Um, with my sixth grade students, I have some students that have only been playing one school year. Um, 
And then I have my seniors, who some of them have been playing six or seven years. So this was a big selling point for me. Um, just to give you an idea of how the music is laid out and what you can expect, the bottom line, or line four, is typically your bass line. It has a really narrow range. Um, it consists of whole, half, and quarter notes, and is considered level one. Line three has a limited range, but does include some eighth notes, and is considered level one and a half. Level two has a bit of a wider range, may include some easy syncopated rhythms, and is considered level two or two and a half, depending on the piece that you choose. The top line is for your intermediate level students. They may contain 16th note combinations, rock and jazz syncopations, and is considered a level two and a half or three. I found that these works, that these books work perfectly for my age and ability level of my students. Um, another perk of these books is that the students can see the full score when they're playing because it has all four parts laid out. So they're able to follow along when I'm rehearsing other sections and kind of listen and see how their part, part fits in. Um, my students are doing really well with these books, yet they're challenged at the same time. I decided to choose three pieces from them um, and contact the public publishers to get permission to have a live stream Christmas concert. Um, one thing my students were extremely bummed about was to hear that we, weren't be we would not be able to have our um, in-person concerts. So once I shared the news of our live stream concert, they were excited that they would be able to share what they've been working on with their family and friends. Um, in addition to the Flexibility Holiday Series, there are also three other series available from the Flexibility um, Series by Victor Lopez. They are Flexibility Classics, Flexibility Pops, and Flexibility More Pops. While I do wish that all of my students could play every rehearsal, I believe that this series is a fantastic alternative to get your students playing more independently as a small ensemble. Um, before I hand it back to Kathy, we're actually going to play one of those pieces for you. Um, we'll play Frosty the Snowman. I thought I would add one more concept besides the in-school concept. As a retired music educator, I have kept up with private lessons. And that is a facet that I'm sure many of your students are doing right now. And one of the things that I have found very important is keeping up with the band directors in the schools where my students go. Because that way I know what the students are doing or not doing. And you have just heard about three different schools. I'm working with, actually, students in two other schools as well. Um, and some of them are more virtual. So I kind of am adding that on because all of my lessons are on Zoom. And because I am seeing them one-on-one -on -one like that, I get their feelings about the music as well as I am able to do some very different things. But as you've heard from my colleagues here, things are very positive. We're doing things that have to do a lot with the computers, and I think that you will find that the students are doing something that's very inventive. But because I'm able to set real individual goals, uh, that I am able to talk about styles, music history, interpretation, and an artistic expression and kind of add to what is happening at the schools. I'm also hearing from a lot of them, and of course, I've got my NISMA mask, and of course, my music masks,
But at the, a lot of the schools, the schools not only have the students wearing masks during the day, all their instruments are also wearing masks. So what I also decided to do was talk to my students, and one of them very nicely wrote me a letter. I'm going to read that to you so that you hear even more about computers. As a high school music student, learning remotely due to the pandemic has both extended my musical abilities and limited my growth. One positive aspect of learning remotely as a music student is the creation of virtual ensembles. Using video editing and audio editing software, multi-instrumentalists such as myself can each play multiple parts of a piece at once, enabling us to create full ensembles on our own. The use of backing tracks and programs such as Music First, Sight Reading Factory, and Practice First has been increasingly useful. Backing tracks enable each student to line up easily with the rest of the ensemble, and music practice programs enable me to receive real-time computer-generated feedback on my playing abilities. On the other hand, remote learning as a student musician has its drawbacks, and one of the la largest disadvantages is the lack of in-person ensembles. My local Symphoria Youth Orchestra is continuing with small in-person chamber ensembles, but I am not able to participate due to COVID-19 risk factors. I miss the joy of playing alongside other musicians, and another disadvantage is the lack of in-person feedback. Since my band course meets via Zoom, we cannot play music out loud. Although practice software like Music First enables my band director to comment, I don't receive the same amount as I would if I was in person. All in all, I do feel that remote learning has shaped the lives of music students for the years to come. Some of the greatest aspects of virtual learning are the use of practice programs and the increase in virtual ensembles. And the greatest disadvantage, of course, is personal feedback. Despite some grievances with virtual learning, I am grateful for the work that all of my music teachers and band directors have put in, into making a successful virtual curriculum. They have been working tirelessly to help us learn and grow as music students. And as Kira said, she is a girl that will stay virtual all year because of concerns. But I will tell you that we are adding her name and her email, email and if any of your students would like to talk about practicing, software, enjoying music during the pandemic, Kira will be glad to talk to them. She is a very positive girl, and she has learned a lot about the computer. So ask yourself if you would like to have your students write to you, or maybe you've already done that, but positive feedback and some of the negative things are probably very good so that you know. And it, I think you've heard from from the other three people that, you know, they are getting feedback about that their students are doing some very positive things because things are different. Since most of you probably are teaching with smaller ensembles and you cannot put 40 to 60 people on a stage, Silverwood has a blog on our website that contains a list of free music sites and other small music publishers there is a lot out there that you could take advantage of, so please do so. We will have that available as, as well. We will finish our session with three pieces that you probably could use your students to play some interesting small ensemble work. And we will have um, a slide showing that. So we're going to start with the Youthful Adventure by Lucien Callier. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, I want to also thank my colleagues from Silverwood. I want to thank Larry Luttinger at Central New York Jazz, excuse me, Jazz Central. I didn't mean to stumble on that. Um, he has been most helpful getting us to be able to produce this video. Thank you very much.
was Youthful Adventure by Lucien Callier, who was the musical and educational director of the Labatt Corporation in the 1950s. He also played with the Philadelphia Music, uh, Philadelphia Orchestra under Leopold Stokowski and Eugene Ormandy. The next one we're going to play is American Sketch by Francis McKay. We put this one in because it is very useful for different combinations of clarinets. You can play it as four B flats, as we are going to do, three B flats and a bass, or if you even looked in your closet and found that alto, which might be kind of fun on it at this time, you could do it as two B flats, alto and bass. And we have actually been able to do many of these pieces by doubling all the parts and turning it into a more of a clarinet choir. So this is American Sketch by Francis McKay. session by playing Easy Winners by Scott Joplin. And this was arranged by Rainier van der Waal, a gentleman from Gudo Holland, who was also the arranger of the Mozart that we opened our session with. He taught for 30 years in Gouda. He also was a member of the Royal Military Band. You can find a lot of music for instruments, especially clarinets, on free scores that he has written. And when he retired, he's picked up the cello and he's also writing some string works as well. So take advantage of some of the most marvelous things that he has done. And Easy Winners being a Scott Joplin, we have found that rags are appealing to audiences of all ages. And by adding that drums, we add some little texture to these small ensembles as well. Thank <laughs> you. 